Good morning, people. After the bright talk this morning by Ajay, it's time to get dark and dirty. Okay? So I'm from Josh Software, and it started in 2007. Uh, these are my Twitter handles. And uh, I'm also an author. I have a couple of books which are out. Well, it doesn't look so dark anymore, does it? So what is my talk going to be about? Don't worry. It's not going to be anything scary. I love Ruby. But as with every marriage, and I hope there's no Ruby in the crowd. OK. As with every marriage, you also need to know the other side. You know, the side you, weren't, you didn't know when you were just going around. But uh, it's the same thing with Ruby. You have to know what we're looking at. And my talk is going to be about the weirdness and the gotcha moments. In short, in my talk, if you find the aha moments, it's working. Uh, we have a varied audience today. So to ensure sanity, I have tagged my slides. My slides are tagged with my good friend Bumblebee to keep it neutral, that these are for beginners. So you must pay attention. And the experts try to give the beginners a chance to give the answer. And the experts, you know, take your inspiration from Optimus Prime. And the beginners can choose to tune out, but whatever you learn, the better. So let's get started with the infamous infinity. Now, we all know what infinity is, right? And since we are all programmers, obviously we should know the answer to this one. What's the answer, man? Uh, no, no, there's no surprises here. No surprises. Eh? All division by zero. We know this. Uh, what about uh, what about this? Oops. This actually works. So we know that you know everything in Ruby is an object. So that looks like a that looks like a class. So let's see what the hell that is anyway. If you type this out, what do you think I get? So what's going on here? So infinity is a constant defined in the float class. But do you see it there? Ne? You don't see it there. I can use this constant to, for range comparisons. I can use it with equality operators and stuff like that. Imagine 3 equal to equal to infinity. But it works. Oh, well. So this is the way I get people warmed up. Let's do something with more of an adrenaline rush. Base conversions. It's a lot of fun. So what do you think is the output of this particular thing? Now, I don't want all the math geeks going into your calculators, but the essence is converting a number to a string in the octal format. So again, no surprises. Should be fine. But let's push the tempo. Now what? That actually works. So the next time you're reading about uh, and you hear names like getafix, vital statistics, you know, obliques, asterisks, it need not be a name, it could be a number. Well, now what? Push the limits. Oops. So now if you look at it a little logically, the radix is supported only 36 because you have 26 alphabets and 10 digits. So we can go only up to a radix of 36. So if uh, there are some innovators out here who want to actually get a new alphabet into the English dictionary, we could probably have a radix of 37. OK, let's move on to the star. Not the rock star, but the star operator. And to start with, let's see what it has to do with the splat expander. Oh boy, we're seeing more and more of Ruby code right now. So what do you think is name and occupation here? As we can see, we have a struct which, takes, which has two some things, name and occupation. And I create an object of a struct. Now what do we see? Nothing fancy still. You're still, you're still good. Right? So the splat expander has actually taken my arguments and given me the right name and the right occupation. But we don't do things like this, do we? We usually, we are Rails programmers. 
We work in Rails, so we usually have stuff like this. We use keyword arguments. Y'all are, you all are aware of keyword arguments using to you know, initiate a class like this and stuff. What is the output now? It's Optimus Prime, so <clears throat> the experts. What is name and occupation? Here it's changed. That's because the struct always has an array of arguments. It does not differentiate between this. This will not work on a class. Well, let's get to something more funny. You have all seen this. How many of you have used this before? We know how to convert, convert an array into a hash. How many of you have used this notation before? Alrighty, I have two people in the audience. Excellent. What happens now? What does this do? It actually converts to a hash. And out of curiosity, what if I have seventh element in the array? Error. You know, like, dude, I don't know what you do. What should I do with the last one? Well, let's try some more stunts. Who all think that the output of this is going to be 3, 6, and 9? Who all think otherwise? So what's the output? Awesome. And now? That was easy, wasn't it? Now what? String on cat. That's how it actually works. And let's take it to the next level. How many of you all know our friend Stabby, Stabby Proc? Here's a sample. So this is a, a Stabby Proc that we have, which takes, note we are still working with star. So if I make an invocation to the block like this, what? is the output. Mumbling, 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 it's five. Ah, and now you say, I knew that. Right? Is the, so basically the short form for the first, second, last, last, and the rest of the stuff is in the middle. Pretty helpful, pretty helpful thing to know. This works on all. It not, it's just not work with the stabby proc, it'll work with the proc, it'll work with the lambda, it'll work with the method too. But as with Ruby, and if I'm supposed to be standing here, and I'm supposed to be lecturing you about all this, I'm supposed to know my stuff. Lo and behold, while I was trying these experiments, I learned something new. What do you think is the output of that? That shit works, and I have freaking no idea how. So uh, let's put it in the slide, and if I have somebody who can explain me how does that dot notation just work, and it works only on this. It'll not work on a method, obviously, right? But it works. So, welcome to the weirdness of Ruby. Well, getting on to really complex stuff. Case statements. All of y'all have, have used cases, right? Case, when, and stuff like that. What do you think this works? And I've tried to make the, make the example as complex as possible. Yeah. If Optimus Prime doesn't do this, who the hell's will there? So, so uh, what is the output? It's pretty obvious that we have a multiple of three, because nine is a multiple of three, and yeah, because we can all read in English, and Ruby gives us readable code, we know the output here, right? Well, it's true. You're absolutely right. Ruby's not that weird. It'll give you the right answers, but my question is, multiple of is a method. Right? It takes one parameter which I have passed. How was it compared with nine? Where did nine come into the picture? Behind every case, behind every successful case, is a case equality operator. So what actually happens is that that number nine is used with a case equality operator. And that case equality operator is an alias to the prop call, which actually gets us our output. Well, though this seems pretty straightforward, it has just given me immense power. I can now manipulate any way that I want a case equality operator to work, simply by overriding the equal to equal to equal to method, the case equality operator. And I'm good to have any sort of case comparisons that I want to make. I don't care what happens, but it's my call anymore, right? 
Speaking of case equality operator, let's go to equality. How many of y'all know these symbols? There are operators and equal question mark and equal question mark. Let's have some fun. <clears throat> Any takers? Who all think the output is true? Who all think the output is false? What happened to the rest of the people? Don't care. Don't care. That's bad for a conference. You know, we just got a huge lecture about participation. So again, who will think it's true? Who will think it's false? Why? <laughs> oh, come on, man. Ruby's going to be really neat. So of course it's true. Ah, well, what do you think now? Anybody think it's true? All right, man, stand up, dude. Please give him a welcome, because he's got it absolutely right. <laughs> what the hell happened to the rest? Dude, we just saw the slide before about case equality. Are you telling me if you use that in a when statement, it's not going to work? Of course it's going to work. You're just comparing one. And well, what? True. How many people think it's true? How many people think it's false? Why? So people got it false who thought it was true but didn't want to answer. Well, it's false. And I've got you guys in the mode where you don't want to answer. Right? Ah, damn it. But this is actually equality by value. So the value returned by that object is 1. Value returned by the float is a floating point 1. It's going to be different. And now what? Now is interesting. Why is it false? Somebody said very confidently, why is it false? Absolutely. Now, here's the weirdness. This stuff actually compares the object IDs of the two, and an integer and a float will have two different object IDs. Which is obvious, right, for us? So, oh, yeah, yeah, true, false, what's it, guys? They're string A. And string A are two different Ruby objects. If I switch that to a symbol, thank you, that's where you go. So with that, let's hit the jackpot. How many of you all know what curry is? It's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. But to make it funnier, I actually decided let's have the slot machine with three pulls. And I wrote code for it on my flight here. So I have no idea whether that's correct or wrong, but let me know. It seems a little weird, though. I've tried to compare if all the three pools are equal, and then I'm preparing some recipe with curry. And do you think it'll work? It just looks a little bit of weird code, but I shall explain it. So curry is a is a method in the proc class which actually returns a lambda if all the parameters are not fulfilled. So in this particular case, I needed three parameters, x, y, and z. And in the first statement, I passed only one. Note, the invocation is in square brackets. It's different. And it returns me a lambda. But the other times, when all the parameters are actually fulfilled in the second statement, it actually evaluates the proc. Now, if you had to write the same code, you would have taken different types of input, waited for the user with get s, maybe. Get s one, two, three, and then evaluated it. You don't need to do that. And these things can actually be very helpful. So curry away. So, so you think you can tell. Protected from private. I'm like, I'm, not a, I'm a better programmer than a singer. Right. <laughs> private methods. All of us have been taught since school, unfortunately. That private methods are not inherited. Are they inherited? As you can see, foo is a private method. And I ran out of creativity, so I just went with the standard base child foo, blah, blah, blah here. Is this going to work? All of us take a lot of things for granted. How many of you all knew this already, that private methods are inherited in Ruby? All right, OK, now I'm scared. How many of you all didn't know this? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. 
Okay, so this is actually one of the one of the basic principles of where Ruby actually breaks traditional object-oriented concepts. All private methods are inherited. Right? How many of you all have seen this code before? Forget the, the manga document, but the include. Everybody knows it. What is include? Is it a keyword? How many thought it was a keyword? <laughs> oh, it's like that require or that import in Java. Include is a private instance method defined in the class module. So while that is sinking in, it raises a basic question. All private methods are inherited. So what are protected methods? So what about protected methods? So what's the difference between private methods and protected methods now? We were told in our school that protected methods are inherited but not publicly accessible, am I right? Now private methods are inherited but not publicly accessible, right? So what are private method, protected methods? Contrary to popular belief in Ruby, protected methods actually work with objects and not classes. And you can invoke a protected method on another object within the same lineage. And I say, what the? What the that weird? Better explain with an example. Simple example for the sake of brevity, I put the initializer in one line. What is the output, people? Don't be shy. We have Bumblebee to help you out. No takers. Come on, man. That's pretty obvious, right? You can't call a protected method on an object, right? Simple stuff. However, now the beginners, so-called beginners can tune out. This is fun. I added a method called fights. Same piece of code. What is the output? Take a wild guess, man. Go for it. So, <laughs> error, Megatron is a Decepticon. <laughs> Any other deceptive ideas? <laughs> uh, guys, very practically, a quick lesson in human psychology. If that didn't work, would I have that slide up there again? <laughs> oh, that works, man, <laughs> that works. But why did it work, and how did it work? The interesting part is that piece of line Earlier in the previous slide, prime.nic did not work, but here target.nic actually works. I have called a protected method on an object. Now that same lineage means that because I'm inside the class autobot, because I'm calling a method on the prime object, which is, in the, which is an autobot class, and since another object called Megatron there is of the same lineage, it's also an autobot, I can call the protected methods. So why did it work earlier? Because everything in Ruby is an object. If you're trying this out, prime.nic in the previous case was outside the scope. So it was effectively in some main class, not the same lineage. So it doesn't work. So Ruby actually works in the traditional way, but has different internal meanings. And if now this was getting a little complicated, how many of you all thought there are keywords in Ruby? Because that man there is going to come and shoot you if you think Ruby has keywords. Does that code work? Is it even valid? Should it give me a syntax error? If, how many of you think will give me an error, syntax error? Dude, what's wrong with you? I've really gone mad, kind of errors. Any takers for syntax errors? Probably not. But if not, then I want to ask you, what is the output of this code? Seriously? <laughs> well, it is seriously. Question is, how many of y'all thought there's an error called stack too deep? Because when I call false, it calls true, which will call true, which will call false, and it'll go to recursive loop and say stack too deep. Any takers for stack too deep? Higher, higher. And how many think it'll actually work? All right, the rest of the people, y'all are below beginners. <laughs> but yeah, this works. So it is not stack too deep. This actually works because true. True's resolution is immediately determined as the Boolean value. 
However, if I had changed these two particular statements, the, the content in the methods to self taught false and self taught true, I would probably get stacked to D. Not probably, definitely get stacked to D. Okay, so if this wasn't complex enough for you, let's go to modules, the mysterious modules. You know, well, suppose I have this Megatron module which has power, Megatron super powerful, and he's, of course, he's evil. And I want to put that in my class Hanuman. Note the star because, like, dude, I want the power of Megatron with Hanuman. Hanuman. Unfortunately, this will not go down too well religiously for us. Because though it will be, Hanuman will be as powerful as Megatron, Hanuman is now evil. So what do I do? Is there a way I can cherry pick from Megatron saying, I want the power of Megatron, but I don't want to be evil. What do I do? I require, note, I have not included Megatron. I require the Megatron method, or Megatron file, Megatron.rb. I define a method called par, and I go to the module, tell him to give me that instance method called par, which gives me something called an unbounded method, and then I bind it to me, that is self, and I call it. And that makes my Hanuman religiously acceptable. To society. Question? No. So note self. Self is the object call. So it's not on working on the class level. It's actually working on the instance. So every object, every instance of Hanuman will actually get the power of Megatron. And with that, I end my talk and thank my two assistants here. I have, I'm open for a few questions. Do I have the time, guys? Satish, do I have some time for questions? Hi, we have a lot of time for questions. All right. Thank you. We have a question there. What exactly led you to title this talk as a dark side of Ruby? Oh. <laughs> now he killed me, didn't it? <laughs> so that was a, a two-sided answer to that. One was to fool the organizers. <laughs> to get the CFP accepted. But more importantly, uh, the dark side of Ruby tries to bring out the weirdness in Ruby, which is, not, which is not the evil part, but the hidden part, like the dark side of the moon, where we have all these kind of stuff, the tricks, the gotchas, the moments that we feel that are going to help, but you don't really need to care about it, but it's really, really important that we know these things exist. That's why dark side of Ruby. So I still love Ruby, no offense. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so have you suffered because of any of these gotchas in your? Absolutely. Program? This is all parts of experience. Yeah. Uh, part is out of experience, part is uh, training, mm -hmm. and partly is uh, preparation for my talk, okay. trying to find out new stunts and figuring things out. There's a lot of stuff that I've actually kept out, like uh, you know, reject, Onigruma games, uh, lots of fun with method missing. I haven't even touched upon blocks, and <laughs> there's lots of funny stuff that happens there. But I have only half an hour. So uh, the question to you guys also is that in case you find some of these funny things which happen in Ruby, and are able to explain it or not able to explain it, just send me send me a tweet, send me an email, and I will probably investigate and improve my talk yeah. at your expense. Yeah. So. The, the other question is, um, are there some practices, certain things that I can follow so that I don't get, uh, so, I don't encounter these? Well, so one thing, these aren't problems. What I wanted to point out here are this is not the bad part of Ruby, but these are the things that we take for granted. So knowing about protected and private being different is important, but not mandatory for us to work as Rails programmers. But if you know that how, how, how protected and private actually work, it makes us better programmers. So best practices of Ruby are already there. Uh, you know, there are things like flip-flops in Ruby, which is, uh, for lack of a better term, a mind star, 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 star. But, and they're not recommended, but it's there. There are plenty of other things in Ruby too, which, which work, which should work, 
which you should use. The bottom line is the Ruby gives us the maximum flexibility to build the way we want to build our code. So with great power comes great responsibility. And sometimes it's irresponsible. So we work that way. Yeah, so is there a good parts of Ruby like good parts of JavaScript? A good? Good parts of Ruby. Oh, good parts, everything. No, I've been working for Ruby in six years and I still love it. No, they, <laughs> there, there is a famous book called Good Parts of JavaScript. Okay. A, a very thin book that allows a subset of language that is very safe to use, which you can be very productive in. So do you, uh, have you come across something that says like there's a subset that you should stick to and you. So the, the best part about Ruby is I like is the closures, which is completely misunderstood because every time I talk to any person who's getting into Ruby and I show him what a closure is, he's like, yeah, that's a loop. But it's not. It's like far more better than that. And it's far more, you know, it's more intuitive. It, it gets into the details and gets us so much more incentive about learning how Ruby internals work that we tend to actually ignore it in Rails. And I, I'm always a firm believer. I have a lot of respect for people who've learned Ruby and gone to Rails because they know the right thing rather than most of us, including me, who got into Rails and then fell in love with Ruby. So it's different. So is Ruby the good parts of your next book? Could be. But I'll need a lot of community support for that. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, just to add to what he asked, uh, I have been checking out exorcism.io. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. So it's actually started by Katrina, uh, who is part of the Ruby Rogues. Uh, right. And I have had a wonderful time learning stuff from Ruby. Like, I've been working in Ruby for the past couple of years, and lots of gotchas so that. Uh, exorcism.io. That's correct. So, uh, um, like, really good Ruby idioms that. Uh, like, so it's basically what happens is you, there are around 10 languages, if I'm not wrong. Uh, you can pick Ruby, you can submit your solutions, people can look at your code, they can give good uh, reviews, uh, you can help out others uh, with your suggestions. Um, yeah, that's well, Ruby. to add to that, there is also some interesting, uh, I'm not sure if y'all have heard of Vim Golf. Vim Golf was a, was a gem and a, a simple tool where you can upload a problem statement and using Vim, you know, execute that in the least number of key presses. Similarly, there are a few initiatives for Ruby Golf, where you can actually try things like uh, the beginner ranch, like Andy Linderman. He actually said they have things uh, where they do, you know, stuff like write this piece of code without using arrays or without using the equality operator. And then you start, your mind starts turning, and then you dig deeper into Ruby and find other things. So the best way to find these things is to try Ruby stunts. All right, we had a question there too. Uh, not really a question, um, but just a suggestion actually uh, to folks who are trying to learn Ruby. Uh, I like that you pointed out that some of the things that we've learned in college, classical object oriented stuff, doesn't really apply. Uh, what really helped me uh, understand differences was that um, treat Ruby as an object focused language, and most of the languages that you probably end up working with, uh, Java, C sharp, they are very class focused. So uh, concepts like private, protected, just like you mentioned, are all, all object level concepts in Ruby. Uh, in fact, if you want to draw, draw parallels, again, JavaScript is a good parallel because JavaScript is also an object focused language. So there are a lot of parallels between JavaScript and uh, Ruby, and lesser between Java and uh, Ruby. Yeah, and, I, and excellent I, I, uh, talk, by the way. Sorry for the dot. That dot thing just amazed me, uh, invoking a <laughs> stabby with a dot. Um, and I was actually kind of disappointed when it ended. I just wanted more. <laughs> okay. oh, cool. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. The well-grounded Rubyists, a must read. Somebody tweet about it, please. Uh, we'll take one last question. How does it help to have protected and private method different from other languages, uh, the way Ruby does it? I'm sorry, did you ask me what is different between protected and no, private how does it help to have it different? Why the design decision to have it different? Oh, excellent. And I love answering this question, though sometimes it can be a little long. Why is private and protected different in Ruby than in other traditional standard languages. Because Ruby did it right. That's how it's supposed to be. For example, <laughs> like, you know, when we talk about object oriented programming, it's supposed to be with objects, things that we can see and touch. For example, inheritance, right? What is inheritance? In, put it in, in no answer term, term, it's my baap ki jaidat, right? My inherited land from my ancestors. It's private. It's inherited. You can, it, it, it comes within the family. It can be protected, it can be private. But if you have your dad's wallet, do you inherit it? You can choose to use it. You can choose not to use it. So it's there. 
the inheritance of land can be protected because it always stays in the family. Like, for example, the money in the family is protected. But that's always dealing with parents and children. You don't go. Your father is just because you have a father and I have a father, I can't go asking your father for money. Right? It remains. How you determine, and of course, public is the same everywhere. So Ruby did it, right? Because it's everything is object centric. Exactly like what Amon, Amon said just now. Everything is object centric. And uh, traditionally in object concepts, it started off right, and then it went all across the tangent where you had this inheritance and in classes and stuff like that, and all those standard things that I never talk about of encapsulation, abstraction, polymorphism, which seem to be the essence of object oriented programming, but is not. So, uh, a follow up question. I, I have sure. it. So is there a well-known pattern that makes use of makes good use of private and protected? Like we understand why include, Ruby does it. Include. Include. Okay. Include is an excellent example. Uh, there are actually other patterns too. There are other patterns which uh, allow for protected. Protected is used very heavily for all sorts of the usual standard way. Why use protected? For example, uh, pr uh, protecting your uh, uh, password generation algorithm or something like that. But that still deals with objects. And since object can be called only from their own lineage, you're always safe. So it works. All well, right. Any more questions? Are there any more questions? We'll take it offline. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gautam. <laughs>